Johanna, it's so great to have you here today at the residence of the Netherlands Embassy. And uh, you have a compelling story. You're the CEO of SkiCons, and your mother is the chief technology officer of that company. And your company plays, plays a role now, very topical, also in developing and harnessing the, the, the quality of vaccines. Could you tell something perhaps about your company and what you're doing? Because I, I looked on your website and it's, it's very intelligent work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, also, as a placeholder for all the other amazing women in science doing amazing stuff. Um, um, it, I'm not a scientist by training, and I have to say, it amazes me to see how many women have been involved in developing the vaccines that we now have and just the basic science around coronavirus. Um, so, yeah, to, back to our story. So, basically, my company. Um, makes monoclonal antibodies that recognize double-stranded RNA. That yes. sounds very complicated, um, but that's uh, basically, they're just a tool that can be used by um, researchers in the lab to see if double-stranded RNA is present in their biological samples. Um, and, and what does that do if it is present? What, yeah. what happens then? Basically, uh, most viruses, including um, the coronavirus, well, SARS-CoV-2, make double-stranded RNA when they replicate. Um, so the presence of double-stranded RNA indicates that there's a live virus present. Okay. Alarm. Alarm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and our antibodies can so antibodies can be used to show that there is a live virus present, as whether there is a live virus present, and where it is, and how much of it there is. So that's very useful. So that is one of the things that your company does. And 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 how is it engaged uh, in, in, in 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 the research that's, that's going on? And it, it and, and it must have been also a lot of a bit of a fast track. Because there's, there's there's the urgent need for, for for vaccines, and people of course also have questions. Have, how is it possible to to work so well together and, and develop in such short time reasonable uh, vaccines? That's true. I mean, it's really amazing how fast this, the, especially the new type mRNA vaccines, have been developed. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of research work has gone into this over the past few years. So we're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. We've been working with the mRNA vaccine makers for years, so it's not a new thing for us. We already had the relationships and they've been using our antibodies um, for a long time, really. Yes. Um, obviously now the pandemic has you know, made everything faster. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. So seemingly we fast. seemingly faster, we feel that. Um, so it's also a bit of an opening of the black box for it, the general yeah. public. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and your mother is the, 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 the chief technology officer. Could you a little, little bit maybe because mothers and daughters, it's always there's always a lot of love, but it's also quite interesting that a mother and a daughter work in the same company. Yeah. So how, how does that go? How does that go? How did you yeah. start? So, so we're a family company, uh, very much an accidental company, um, but the way it evolved is we're a family company. My mother is the inventor of the antibodies, so she, um, and she's still our chief scientific officer, so she does all the science. She's originally an academic at university, and she never intended to start a company, so that bit is... That's where, like, that's where I came in, so that's the accidental bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I love my family, but being in a family company can be tough. Um, I think especially because the boundaries between like personal and professional life can become quite blurred. Yes. And I think anyone who's been trying to work from home during the pandemic can probably understand <laughs> <laughs> what that's like. <laughs> it's not always easy. No, 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 no yeah. I, I see that because, because you're working, you're working to solve the pandemic, and at the same time, you're also personally, you and your family, your friends, you're, you're, you're confronted with the pandemic. Could you perhaps also say a few words about what that, yeah, how that impacted your work? Yeah, I think I feel very lucky. I feel lucky that you know I've had a job, and not just a job that pays the bills, but a job that to me felt very meaningful because you know we, I felt like I could do my bit to help in the fight against the pandemic. I could do something. Um, yeah. To me, that, that felt was very important, and it felt good. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm also, I'm a single mom. I have three kids. Okay, um, okay. lucky you. So yeah, okay. so while it was great to still be going to work and to have something to do at the same time, there were times when I was not at all happy to be going to work because obviously when you know, nurseries and schools closed, yeah. my kids were at home. Um, the homeschooling. Exactly, it's, yeah. it's a very difficult situation yeah. for yeah. many people. Yeah. Um, so I really think that um, while I think social distancing and, and all these measures that have come in are very, very important and I absolutely support them, I do think it's really important 
to recognize that they also have a huge impact on people, in particular, I think, women. Yep. Um, and I'd, I'd actually like to give a shout out to all those women who are not on the front line and not in the public eye um, no, and it, working behind the scenes. I, I, I understood that you're is in is in, a, is in a rather small village. Uh, how much time do you have to commute between Skikon and your, and your home? So I should cheat a bit. So we okay. have... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't drive and neither does my mother, which is part of the reason why our lab is based in, in Sirak. So my mother doesn't have to commute. Okay, yes. so your mom is in Sirak. Yeah, so my mom is based in Sirak and the laboratory and all our laboratory staff are based in Sirak. Um, but we have a small sales office in Budapest. That makes sense because the airport is closed yeah. and, and things like that. So I spend most of my time in the sales office in Budapest, especially now. Um, I go to Sirak once a week, roughly. And, and we were, of course, we were talking also, with, we're, it's still, unfortunately, we're now sort of in the third wave of the pandemic. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about the quality of vaccines. And it's sometimes even people question the very existence, of which I really don't understand. I think it's incredibly uh, unwise, but they question even the, 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 the severity of the disease. But what would be your message based on the knowledge of you and everyone in your company, and your mothers and your experience and being a lawyer? So lawyers always know that they have to tell the truth. <laughs> I think that's an interesting one. So I think there's plenty of evidence that the virus exists. I mean, you know, there's lots of people dying every day. And I think there's also a lot of sound scientific data that the vaccines that have been approved by the relevant authorities are safe, that we can trust them. Um, but at the same time, I'd be careful condemning people who, who, who doubt that the virus exists or who have doubts about taking the vaccines. I think it's important to listen to what they have to say. Um, and I think, I think some of the doubts are actually very relatable and, and often based on either misinformation or not enough information being available. So one thing I experienced because we've been in the news quite a bit lately is just I've had lots of random people calling me, members of the public, just to ask for information. Yeah, Johanna, what's going on? No, no. Yeah. Like, um, there was one woman who struck me in particular. She, she has a daughter with an autoimmune um, disease, and they've been stuck at home, yeah. not really daring to venture out at all because they're so worried that the daughter might get infected. Yeah. Then the vaccine comes along, and they're elated. They're so happy. Yes. They're not really doubters. They'd love to give her the vaccine, but they don't know if a person with an autoimmune disease is eligible, it can have the vaccine safely. So they're looking for information. They call their GP, the GP refers them to health authorities, they call health authorities, health authorities refer them back to the GP, and they're just stuck. Yep. So, I mean, these are concerns, I think, that are perfectly understandable and we can all relate to. And there is a problem just with information flow, I think. Yep. Yes, yes. If people want to have information on, on the vaccine, to which websites would you refer them? Um, well, I think that's an interesting one. So um, I mean, there are some websites which I personally prefer, but I think generally one of the problems that there is is, I mean, I think there are two problems. One is science communication. People, I mean, there's a lot of scientific language that's difficult to yeah, understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I face that. I'm a lawyer by training. So when people go off on a tangent about DNA, RNA, blah, blah, I have to think about it and I have to get people to explain it to me. Scientists are not always good at explaining the science to lay people. And a lot of communicators and journalists are not so good at understanding the science. So we have a bit of, I mean, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, let's put it that way. So I think that's one problem. And then a totally separate problem that maybe isn't talked about that much, but, and it's a sensitive issue, but I think it's kind of polarization and politicization of our society. Yeah. That people find it difficult to trust sources, um, particularly government sources maybe, but also other sources, just sources in general. Um, so I think what is badly needed is just an independent science-based source that people feel they can trust and turn to for unbiased information. Um, so some of the sources I like to follow have names like the Unbiased Science Podcast, um, and they try to do the just unbiased that. Unbiased Science Podcast. Yes. Okay. They try to do just that, you know, be an, an unbiased source of science that explains to lay people okay. also. In Hungary, there are also projects, so the University of Szeged and the University of Speech, they both set up blogs and websites um, to, to help plug that gap. I think they're doing a great job, oh, right. but as far as I know, they're all volunteers, so you know, it, it, it's hard. I yeah. mean, I toyed with the idea of helping, but then you have your day job, it, it's hard. In a way, I, I can't wait to get my jab. Uh, but I'm still I'm still waiting. Um, will, will you will you will you get the vaccine? 
Yeah, absolutely. Of course. I mean, I, I do think that vaccinations are very important, but coming back to the doubters and stuff, I think yeah. it's just normal and no one likes to be jabbed. So I think it's normal to have a bit of like, a, ooh, and especially with the new type of vaccines, yeah. I'm very, very excited about them. The thing about these mRNA vaccines is that they're not as good against COVID or against viruses uh -huh. in the future. And we're already seeing this in our day to day work. They'll be hopefully they'll be able to make mRNA vaccines against cancers, really? inheritable disease. It's the really same really principle. Good. So I mean, basically, what these vaccines do is they make your, they provide a blueprint for your body to produce yeah. proteins, and you can do that against all kinds of different targets. When, when did this research start on this on this type of vaccination? When did it start? Oh, that's a very good question, and I, th I think it probably did start with people like Katalin Kariko. Hungarian yeah. researcher who yes. worked at UPenn, yeah. who's been all over the news. So, so she did great work. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, th I think she laid some of the foundations for the practical applications of mRNA technology. She wasn't the only one. Obviously, there are lots of different components that go into this. Um, um, so, for example, developing, you know, one of the problems that people had was how to get this mRNA stuff into your body. Um, and they do it nowadays by something called lipid nanoparticles. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was already <laughs> I'm an economist, so yeah, I'm, uh, it's yeah. very easy for me to understand. So, <laughs> <laughs> the lipid nano, uh, so obviously, you know, you have companies who develop the lipid nanoparticles and done a lot of great work around that. All these things were going on in, in parallel. Um, but I'd say that, I mean, definitely, we've been busy in this space over the last five years, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's a serious, there's a serious, volume of research being done on this and it's and it's and it's a very interesting avenue that, that can have applications in many different fields now what is important about march 8th is of course also uh, thinking about and celebrating the role of women in, 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 in the hungarian society and uh there are many i mean women contribute in many brilliant ways uh, whether as mother as housewife but also as scientists um, what would be your message to, to, to young women who are thinking about their, their career and their life? Uh, because, because you're an example of a, of a mother and a scientist, you combine those roles. Uh, it must be a lot of work, it must, it must also give a lot of satisfaction and love, but it's, it's quite something. So I think Hungarians tend to be quite pessimistic. Um, I think my first message would be um, try to resist that. Um, Believe in yourself and don't be afraid to fail. I think that's my message. Yeah. It's Women's Day. Uh, <laughs> it's also something to celebrate. And uh, be, being, the, being the ambassador of the Netherlands, oh. of course, I would, we always like to celebrate these things with, with, with our national flower. Oh, um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's a little bit of orange in it because that is the Netherlands. Oh. And of course, we. The tulips originally actually come from, from Turkey. We, we adopted it as our national uh, flower. And, um, it's, it's always been a bit of a mania in the Netherlands uh, in, 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 in our golden age, but, but it's still a very popular flower uh, nowadays. So uh, I, ho I hope yellow and, uh, and, and orange are your colors. Thank and you very much. Lovely. I'll take them into the office <laughs> so we can celebrate together. Absolutely. So uh, thank you so much.